Math 0232, Support for Math 1332, Chapter 2, Section 1, Introduction to Set Theory. Pause the video here just for a second. All right, that's a little bit better. I turned off the light behind me. It's a little darker, but at least it's not uh, a glare. All right, so uh, in this video, I'm going to, as the name uh, describes, go over some topics to support the first section in Chapter 2 of Math 1332. This is not the entire content of this section, but rather lays a foundation for you to get off to a good start. All right, let's go to the first page. I have a little issue clicking on things here. All right, there we go. Uh, the way this video is going to work is as we go through these, I will uncover pieces that are covered up as if I were writing them on a board and you couldn't see them in advance. So let's start with some basic theory, basic set theory concepts and vocabulary. Um, since we're going to be talking about set theory, it makes sense to start with the definition of a set. And a set is simply a collection of objects. Uh, the objects don't have to be anything in particular. They can be numbers, they can be words, they can be letters, they can be people, they can be animals, they can be books, they can be anything that you want. Sets are usually named with a single capital letter. In algebra, when you don't know the value of a number, you typically represent it with a lowercase letter. In set theory, when you don't know the contents of a set, you generically name it with a single capital letter, or even if you do know the contents of the set. An element is a single object a set may or may not contain. So if you think about a, a set as a collection of objects, then one of those objects is considered an element. One way to write a set is in roster form. Now you've probably heard the word roster before, especially if you play sports and you're on the, the team's roster. Uh, this is when you write a set in a pair of braces and braces look like that. If you draw them, if you draw them manually, you should put a little pinch in the middle. If you draw them slowly enough, I'm not perfect at drawing braces, but usually you can tell what I mean. On the keyboard, they are above the close and open brackets, at least on my keyboard. Excuse me. All right. So anyway, let's continue. Uh, uh, roster form is when you write a set in a pair of braces, separating the, its elements with commas. For example, we could say the set S is equal to the set containing 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. And by the way, the reason this set contains these elements is completely irrelevant. There may be a reason those numbers are put together in a set. There may not be. It may just be a random collection of elements. But as far as the definition is of a set goes, there doesn't have to be a reason that these things are grouped together as a single set. In this case, they're perfect squares, which is why I chose S, but there doesn't have to be a reason for elements to be together. Uh, for example, we could say set B is the set containing dog, cat, and turtle. Again, there doesn't have to be a reason for these elements to be together. They happen to be the types of pets that live in my house. Or we could say something like the set C contains the elements 1, 2, 3, all the way through 20. And notice the three dots. Those three dots are called ellipses. Some set use ellipsis, or ellipsis, I should say. Uh, that's the three dots indicating that the pattern continues, not continutes. That's not a word. Obviously, the word processor in Zoom doesn't have a spell check. Um, but whenever you see the three dots, it just means I've established a pattern and it keeps going until I tell you that it stops. Another way to write a set is in the descriptive method. Instead of listing the elements of a set, you describe them. For example, we could say set E is the set of all positive even numbers. Now, I'm assuming you know what even numbers are, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. Specifically, a number is even if when you divide it by 2, its remainder is 0. Or we could say set C is the set of all cities in Texas whose population is at least 100,000. 
Now, some might argue that some cities will go into this set and, and come out of the set as their populations go up and down. So we could be a little bit more specific and say something like, we'll say something like this. C equals the set of all cities in Texas whose population is at least 100,000 on January 1st, uh, 2021. That way we have a more uh, well-defined set, if you will. Speaking of which, you have to be careful when using the descriptive method. You must make sure that your set is well-defined. I'm kind of giving you a definition here for well-defined. This means it must be objective whether or not an element belongs to the set. In other words, you should be able to determine without subjectivity or bias whether or not an element belongs to a set. For example, the set A equals the set of all beautiful women in Texas is not well-defined since whether or not a woman belongs to the set is subjective. It's based on your opinion. By contrast, the set A equals the set of all women in Texas who were born in Smith County is well-defined since membership in the set is objective. I can't say this woman belongs to the set and somebody else say this woman doesn't belong to the set. It's not subject to our opinion, it's objective. A third way to write a set is called set builder notation. And I'll tell you right now, this one is a little bit different, but it's not difficult. This is sort of a combination of roster form and the descriptive method. Looks like we got a typo, typo fixed. So set builder notation is sort of a combination of the roster form and the descriptive method. It looks like roster form because the set is in braces. It looks like descriptive method because you describe the elements of the set. For example, uh, let's take the set five, six, seven, eight, and so on in set builder notation. It could be written as the following. Now this is gonna look funny, I'll explain all the pieces. We notice the braces around the set, but at the beginning we have an X followed by a vertical bar. And then the statement X is a natural number and X is greater than four. Now I haven't defined natural numbers yet and I'll, I'll define those shortly. But if we just assume that you're not considering decimals or fractions, and I ask you to list the numbers greater than four, you're probably gonna start with five, six, seven, and eight. The first X, represents a generic element of the set. The vertical bar is read as the phrase such that. And the phrase after the vertical bar describes the elements of the sets. So how do you read this thing? Well, this set builder notation, the one that we have here, would be read as follows. You start by saying the set of X's or whatever the generic element is at the beginning. It's usually the letter X, but it can be other things as well. So you start by saying the set of X's, make sure you say it plural. And then the vertical bar is read such that, and then you read the description. X is a natural number and X is greater than four. It's really not difficult as long as you remember to start by saying the set of X's, plural, such that, and then just read whatever is after it. And if you notice, I've got the same set and set builder notation right here, the set of X's, such that X is a natural number and X is greater than four. In this last example, I included a couple of concepts that I'm going to elaborate on. Uh, the first is the symbol greater than. In your past math experiences, you most likely have enc encountered the following symbols. The symbol for greater than, the symbol for less than, the symbol for greater than or equal to, and the symbol for less than or equal to. Sorry, folks, I got my phone refreshing, checking on something. The ones with the lines underneath them mean it's okay if the numbers on both sides are equal. For example, Saying five is greater than or equal to five is a true statement because you said five is greater than or equal to five. Well, five is equal to five. But 
the statement five is greater than five is a false statement because five is not more than five. However, something like both six is greater than or equal to five and six is greater than five are true statements. The first one is true because you say six is greater than or equal to five. In the greater than or equal to and the less than or equal to inequalities, only one of those has to be true for the entire statement to be true. So if I some, say something is greater than or equal to, it means exactly that. It's either greater than it or it's equal to it. The second concept in the set builder notation that I want to elaborate on is the set of natural numbers. Now, that's not just some random adjective that I threw out there, it is well-defined. The natural numbers are the numbers you count with starting with one. And the natural numbers have a certain capital letter reserved for their name, a capital N. So N, the set of natural numbers, is the set containing one, two, three, four, and so on forever. Notice the use of ellipses. This is because the pattern continues, but without end. It's possible for ellipses to indicate a pattern that ends at some point. It's also possible for ellipses to indicate a pattern that continues without end. Here's some more sets of numbers with capital letters reserved for their names. You're gonna see some of these more often than others throughout the course, but I would be remiss if I didn't introduce them all. The set of whole numbers whose reserved letter is a capital W, is the set containing 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. You could also say that the whole numbers are just the natural numbers with 0 added to the set. The set of integers is represented with a capital Z. It's for the German word for integers. And it picks up the negative numbers. Now, the negative numbers do go forever to the left. 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And as a consequence, this set actually starts with ellipses and ends with them as well. 1, 2, 3. Notice the integers contains all the whole numbers, and then we just throw in the negatives. The next set of uh, numbers with a capital letter reserved for their name are the rational numbers, which is represented with the letter Q. And if you notice this one's in set builder notation, I'm going to highlight it as I read it. The rational numbers are the set of fractions P over Q such that P and Q are integers and Q is not equal to zero. Uh, in other words, it's the set of fractions. This just means the rational numbers are all possible fractions that can be made by putting one integer. Give me a second to fix that typo. There we go. The rational numbers are all possible fractions that can be made by putting one integer on top of another. What the heck is that? OK, I think I caught all the typos and fixed them, so I don't have to pause anymore. So let's try this one more time. The rational numbers, we'll get rid of this highlight and start over. The rational numbers reserved uh, with the letter Q is the set of all fractions P over Q such that P and Q are integers and Q is not equal to zero. Note, this just means the rational numbers are all possible fractions that can be made by putting one integer on top of another. In other words, we take one number from this set and hey, there's my name. How neat. We take one number from this set. I want that to go away. I forgot I don't like using those arrows. Dag nabbit. Okay, just ignore that yellow arrow. Uh, to form a rational number, we take one number from the integers and put it on top of another number from the integers, as long as the one on the bottom is not equal to zero. Uh, the rational numbers can also be thought of as all decimal numbers that either terminate like 2.5 or eventually repeat like 1.83 with the bar over the three meaning that the three goes on forever so it's really 1.8 without end 
The next set of numbers is the irrational numbers. Now the word irrational was explicitly chosen to mean the opposite of rational, the root word of rational being ratio, ratio of integers. So irrational means not rational. The set of irrational numbers is the set of numbers that cannot be written as a fraction. And yes, there are such numbers. And when I say fraction, what I should really say is as a ratio of integers. Note, such numbers exist. The most common such number is pi. Most people think pi is about 3.14. Well, it is about 3.14, but it's not exactly 3.14. As a decimal, uh, pi goes forever, but the digits never repeat. Well, the digits individually have to repeat eventually. There's only 10 digits to choose from, but they never repeat in a predictable pattern like a repeating three or something. In terms of decimals, you can think of irrational numbers as numbers whose decimals never end and never repeat. And the last set of numbers is the set of real numbers reserved with the capital R. It's just the set of rational numbers joined with the set of all irrational numbers. In other words, you take all your decimals that behave, they either end or repeat, and you take all your decimals that misbehave, they never end, they never repeat. You dump them all together in one big batch of numbers, and that's called the real numbers. So you can think of the real numbers as all possible decimals. All right, one last comment about these special sets of numbers. With the exception of the irrational numbers, the decimals that never end and never repeat, you can think of these sets as getting larger and larger in the sense that one set is completely contained inside the next set. For example, the set of natural numbers, capital N equals one, two, three, four, et cetera, is completely contained inside the set of whole numbers, capital W equals zero, comma, one, comma, two, comma, three, comma, four, forever. Every natural number is also a whole number. Similarly, every whole number is an integer. Remember the integers we obtained by taking the whole numbers and appending the negatives to them. Didn't mean to see all that yet. Every integer is a rational number. Remember, rational numbers were the fractions, the ratios of integers. Uh, the reason every integer is a rational number is an integer like three can be written as a ratio, excuse me, a ratio of integers. For example, three over one, that fraction is equal to three as is six over two, as is something like 45 over 15. There's actually an infinite number of fractions that equal to three, but the fact that three can be written as a fraction, as a ratio of integers, means that it is a rational number. And finally, every rational number is a real number. There are numbers outside of the real numbers. There is a larger set uh, that contains the real numbers, but also contains some other things. They're called complex numbers, but we're not gonna go that far. You can think of these sets as nested boxes. Look on the innermost box just for a second, the natural numbers. Here's a box of numbers and this is what it contains. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. But we have a bigger box that contains the whole numbers. What's inside that bigger box? All the natural numbers. And if you notice, I added the number zero into the box. Notice the zero is outside the natural number box because zero is not a natural number. But there's a bigger box of numbers, the integers, which contains all the whole numbers, which contains all the natural numbers. And there's a bigger box of numbers, the rational numbers, which contains all the integers and the whole numbers and the natural numbers. Notice the numbers that I put in the rational number box that are outside the integer box, one half, negative 0 0.75, negative 22 over seven, that repeating decimal, et cetera. All of those are rational numbers, but not integers, which is why they live inside the rational number box, but outside the integer box. And lastly, the biggest box we talked about were the real numbers, which contains all possible decimals. Notice I put pi, I put that random decimal with no repeating pattern, and I put the square root of two, which is an irrational number, but it is a real number. So those numbers being irrational live outside the rational number box, but everybody lives inside the real number box.
All right, the last thing for this video is the relationship between an element and a set. This is something that you're gonna see repeatedly throughout the rest of this chapter. Recall that a set is a collection of objects, whereas an element is a single object that may or may not belong to a set. To show that an element belongs to a set, we use the following symbol. It kind of looks like a curvy letter E. When you draw it, it looks something like this. Maybe a C with the line through the middle of it. But it does kind of look like the letter E. This symbol is red is an element of. Let me highlight that because it's important to know that this symbol translates to the phrase is an element of. Well, didn't even do that. There go. Its opposite, which looks like this, pretty standard opposite notation in math where you just draw a line through a symbol, but its opposite is red is not an element of. It states that something doesn't belong to a set. Each state, whether or not an element belongs to a set. So when you see a statement written symbolically with this symbol, what you are saying is either this object belongs to that collection or this object does not belong to that collection. For example, the following statements are true. Five is an element of the natural numbers. Well, I just read how it would be read, but this would be read, this statement symbolically would be read, five is an element of the natural numbers, which is a true statement. Natural numbers are the numbers you count with, and when you count, you do say the number five. Negative three is not an element of the whole numbers. This would be read negative three is not an element of the whole numbers, which is true. The whole numbers start with zero, but they don't include negative. So that is a true statement. Negative three is not a whole number. Three halves is not an element of the integers. Remember, the integers were the positive and negative whole numbers, but they don't include fractions or decimals. Three halves is an element of the rational numbers. Now, if you haven't internalized that Z means integers and Q means rational numbers, I understand. Uh, you won't see those nearly as often as natural numbers and whole numbers. And that would be read three halves as an element of the rational numbers, which is true. The rational numbers are all ratios of integers. Since three is an integer and two is an integer, then three over two is a rational number. Dog is an element of the set containing dog, cat, and turtle. That is a true statement. This element belongs to that collection. Again, I want to emphasize that this symbol is stating a relationship between a single object and a collection of objects. By contrast, fish. Didn't mean to do all that. Hold on. Don't look at that under the orange yet. That's why I got to be careful on these videos. Sometimes I expose things too early. By contrast, fish is not an element of the set containing dog, cat, and turtle. So all of those are true statements. Now, by contrast, you can write statements that are false. For example, the statement negative seven is an element of the natural numbers is false. In some of your homework, in your homework, some of the questions ask you, is this statement true or false? So read it and then ask yourself. But negative seven is an element of the natural numbers is false because negative seven is not an element of the natural numbers. Zero is not an element of the whole numbers is a false statement. Sometimes you just have to say the words and maybe even write them. This second one says zero is not a whole number. That's what that second statement is saying, but that is a false statement because zero is a whole number. What's the next one? 17.5 is an element of the integers. That is false. Remember the integers, which are back here somewhere, the integers, up here are all the positive and negative whole numbers. 
17.5 is not a positive or negative whole number. So to say that 17.5 is an integer is a false statement. And lastly, pi is an element of the rational numbers. The rational numbers are all of your ratios of integers, but as decimals, they are decimals that either end or eventually repeat. Pi does not end, pi does not eventually repeat. Pi is not a rational number, so saying it is a rational number is a false statement. There is more to the section, but this was just an introduction to it. The remainder of the section will be covered in the credit half of your co-requisite pair. If you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me.